So the New England colonies that included Plymouth, where the Pilgrims resided, Massachusetts Bay, where the, Pil Pil uh, the Puritans lived, New Haven and Hartford, which were both in Connecticut, all came together for the purpose of protection. They formed an alliance and it's the first seeds of any kind of colonial unity in, in America. Unity is gonna be very difficult because as you could see already, you have Virginia settled by people wanting to make money, either mining for gold or, or later on tobacco. Um, you know, you had Maryland started by the Catholics. You had Georgia started by uh, prisoners, a debtors colony. Um, you know, you have different colonies start for different reasons. Uh, so unity is going to be really tough to get all these uh, colonies to come together for the purpose of defense if they need to do it at any time. And you know they are. Obviously, the, the uh, revolution is going to happen. And, you know, the first time that you saw any kind of unity was right here in 1643, and it was called the New England Confederation. It's when Massachusetts Bay Puritans, the Plymouth Pilgrims, New Haven and Hartford, um, that were Thomas Hooker's colony in Connecticut, got together and said, hey, we need to have each other's backs. They created a what's called a semi-autonomous commonwealth. Semi-autonomous means they share power, and uh, commonwealth means a group of people coming together uh, for a purpose. And the, the purpose for this was defense against Native American attack, the French, and the Dutch. The Dutch were located, as we'll find out in a few minutes here, in uh, what is the future New York. They called it New Netherlands. Um, so they were a threat. The French have always been a threat because England and France had a fierce rivalry. And, uh, you know, that a colonist felt like the French were their biggest rival, when in reality, their biggest rival would be the Native Americans that were, you know, right in their backyard. So these, uh, colonies coming together for the purpose to, of defense was the first seeds of any kind of colonial unity. It's not going to be that well organized as you could see, you could, you know, probably guess that communication is going to be very difficult. It's not like they could pick up a cell phone or have any kind of communication whatsoever other than face to face. Most everything was done through messages. So it was difficult. Uh, it was hard to get from one colony to another because of distance barriers like crossing of rivers and mountains and things like that. So um, it's a barely unity, but it's unity nonetheless. So that that's the, the first time that happened. Now, later on, years later in 1686, England tried to exert their power over the colonies with what's called the Dominion of New England. And you want to talk about foreshadowing. This is foreshadowing the coming revolution that's going to happen when England's going to try to control the colonies. Uh, the purpose for doing this was the same as the New England Confederation. It was for the purpose of defense. And they wanted to uh, be able to protect the colonies. And they sent this guy, uh, Sir Edmund Andros, from England to the colonies to help them out. Well, the colonies felt like this guy was acting as a dictator. Um, they didn't like England interfering. And, uh, you know, it was just a disaster. It was, it was, it was terrible. And it, the whole thing blew up. So two examples of foreshadowing. The uh, Dominion of New England foreshadow England taking over the colonies and trying to control them. That's going to lead to the revolution. Um, the New England Confederation foreshadowed the future seeds of unit, the unity needed to be able to defeat the British. So interesting things happening. And all this happened during what's called the Glorious Revolution when William and Mary took over power in England. Um, never again was England to be ruled by a monarchy. It was going to be shared power between Parliament and uh, kings and queens. And it's going to lead to more interference in the colonies and it's going to lead to the revolution too. So a, a, a period of first before that is called salutary neglect. We'll be talking about this concept of salutary neglect. Um, the colonies felt like they were neglected by England. They, didn't, they weren't getting the things that they needed. England was ignoring them because England was dealing with problems at home, wars against France, religious issues, and you know the colonies were put on the back burner. Well, the colonists are, are saying, well, what about us? They were neglected. 
it's called salutary neglect because in the end, it ends up being a good thing for the colonist. Why a good thing? Because they got stronger because of that neglect. They were forced to fend for themselves. They didn't have to rely on England anymore. And they got stronger. Because of neglect, they became self-sufficient. And in the end, they defeat the British and win their freedom and independence. And a lot of people attribute it to the neglect that happened that got them stronger. So this, this is a, obviously the neglect is going to lead, it's going to evolve into control for a little while. And then the explosion happens that it's a revolution. So just as we looked at um, the Southern colonies all together, we're going to look at the Northern colonies now, uh, Massachusetts, Rhode Island, Connecticut, New Hampshire, never going to ask any questions about New Hampshire, not much in history books about um, New Hampshire. Um, but anyways, we're going to talk about them collectively. Massachusetts, Rhode Island, Connecticut, New Hampshire. Memorize those. Remember, the, the uh, southern colonies were Virginia, Maryland, North Carolina, South Carolina, and Georgia. Okay, northern colonies, once again, Massachusetts, settled by the Pilgrims and Puritans. Rhode Island, started by, um, started by uh, the cast-off preacher um, from uh, Massachusetts Bay. Uh, and then you had Connecticut, another preacher from, uh, started that one from uh, Massachusetts, Hooker, and then New Hampshire. They were all collectively settled for religious reasons. And, and uh, you know, that religion dominated in this area. Puritan religion specifically dominated. What they did for a living here, trade, shipbuilding, fishing, were the, that, those were their main sources of income. Notice you don't see farming on there. They absolutely did farm, but they were, as we said before, subsistence farms where you grow what you eat and you eat what you grow. They were fiercely independent because England didn't really associate with the northern colonies. There wasn't a lot of trade that went on. Um, they didn't grow crops. Um, you know, there, there was just whole, wasn't a whole lot of trade. They're, they're mo the rivers up in the north are fast moving and non-navigable by ships. So England didn't do what they did in the south and then like go up all the rivers and communicate with the people and bring them goods. That just didn't happen in the north. No surprise here when the revolution happens. It starts in Boston. And you have the Boston Massacre, the Boston Tea Party, those kind of things. Up in the north, you had rocky, infertile soil. Uh, and that led to only subsistence farm, growing, growing which, which you could feed your family. And as I said, oftentimes families were huge in the north, um, upwards of you know, 10, 15 kids. So a lot of kids up, up there. So the, the uh, soil might not be fertile, but the women sure were. They had lots and lots of kids up there, strong family ties. So northern, northern colonies. Okay, now we're going to jump over to the middle colonies. So we had 13 of them. So you had five from the south. You had five, uh, four from the north. And you're also going to have four from the middle colonies. So let's look at the first middle colony, and that's New York. Now I have in parentheses here New Netherlands because uh, that's what the Dutch named it. And interestingly enough, on the eastern seaboard, the eastern seaboard is dominated by England with the exception of two areas. Uh, uh, the New York by the Dutch and then Florida by the Spanish. We've already talked about the Florida in the Spanish coming out of Florida, attacking the English. And that's why Georgia was set up in the South. But uh, New York was settled by the Dutch because of the voyage of a man by the name of Henry Hudson. If you've ever heard of the Hudson river in New York, it's named after Henry Hudson. Henry Hudson was English. However, he was sailing in a Dutch ship. And he, and he uh, you know, founded New York in 1609. And the Dutch laid claim to it because they said, well, Henry Hudson was sailing in a Dutch ship, so we're going to take it. Now, if the English really wanted New York at that time, they could have just taken it. They didn't know how valuable New York was or is. New York's probably the most, you know, important piece of property in all of the Americas uh, for a long time. Uh, because of the deep harbor. England at this time in 1609 had no idea about that valuable harbor and uh, didn't do anything about the Dutch settling in that area. And the Dutch were 
I wouldn't call them a world power at this time, but they're pretty strong. The Dutch East India Company, which was uh, a joint stock company, just like the Virginia Company was, uh, it, it was established and they settled this in this area. Uh, 190 ships, 10,000 men, so it was heavily populated. They uh, gave away pieces of land, patroon ships, uh, much like encomiendas that the Spanish, uh, their plots of land were called. Patroon ships were large areas of lands that were given uh, to anybody who, who agreed to settle at least 50 people on their land, and they'd get this patroon ship. The, the soil was pretty fertile in New York, way more fertile than in New England. The problem here is that the Dutch didn't get along with the Native Americans and it caused harsh relationships between the natives and the, uh, the Dutch. So there was a, a wall that was built uh, in town, in the, in the town of New Amsterdam, which was the capital of New Netherlands, which is today New York City. And the wall was meant to keep the uh, Dutch safe from Native American attack, to block the Native Americans from being able to attack the valuable harbor um, and of course, that is where Wall Street is today. Um, if you didn't know that, Wall Street was a wall that was built to protect the Dutch from Native American attack. So this picture right here shows you New Amsterdam in 1664. Uh, you could see the um, Dutch influence there by the structure of the houses and the windmill. Um, so that this is the site of Manhattan Island today. So if you look at this, picture, um, this area over here on the opposite side is where that, whoever was painting that previous picture right here was on that piece of land and they're looking over and they're painting this. So you're looking at it from this perspective over here, looking at in this area. So um, the, the Twin Towers, September 11th taken down uh, here by the two airplanes. This is where the Twin Towers were. Um, if you could see my cursor right there. This is before they built the monument when this picture was taken. Uh, but you know, you could pretty much guess that when uh, England wanted uh, New New Netherlands or New York, they took it. In 1664, Charles II, King of England at the time, granted the area uh, to his brother, the Duke of York, and that's where the, the uh, name New York comes from. So the British landed and they took it without a shot being fired. Peter Stuyvesant here, who uh, was the governor of New Netherlands, basically handed over, um, he didn't like it, but he handed it over to the English because they knew they couldn't stand up to the English. So Peter Stuyvesant had his leg blown off by a cannonball in war at some point. So now it became New York and it was in the hands of the British. So everything from Massachusetts in the North down to Georgia in the South all belonged to England at this point. What's left only is Florida. So there's where New York is right there. You can see the pr close proximity to the other middle colonies, Pennsylvania and New Jersey, that we're going to and, uh, and that we're in Delaware that we're going to be talking about next. Okay, let's talk about Pennsylvania. They have a picture of Quaker um, Quaker Oats there. It, the uh, the reason I have it on there is because uh, that is William Penn, who's the founder of Pennsylvania. So a little bit about William Penn. Uh, William Penn, Penn was actually royal, not royalty, but he was in the military in um, England. His father was, was a, a captain in the Navy, and he was very, very, very wealthy. In fact, so wealthy that the government of England borrowed money from him to stay afloat. So England owed William Penn Sr., William Penn's father, a lot of money. William Penn Jr. followed in his father's footsteps and became a Navy captain as well. However, he was uh, always had this yearning to do something else. He attended a meeting of the Society of Friends, they were called, and it was the Quakers. They had a meeting, meeting and he attended, and he, and he immediately fell in love with the religion, and uh, he wanted to become a Quaker. Quakers believed in uh, turning the other cheek. Uh, they were very peaceful. Um, they did not uh, agree with war at all. Um, and they, they were pacifists, were, were called pacifists. He immediately bought into it, but that didn't 
you know, being a pacifist and being in the Navy, um, you know, they didn't go together. So William Penn went to the king and said, look, um, you owe me a large sum of money because I was, he was the one that inherited the, the debt, debt that the uh, country owed his father. And um, so he uh, told the king, look, I will forgive your debt as long as you give me a charter permission to settle in a new world and I could take all my Quaker followers with me. And he, he said he'd, he, he'd want to do that. The king agreed to it as long as he named it after his father and called it Pennsylvania. At first, William Penn didn't want to do that because he didn't want anybody thinking that, you know, he named it after himself. Um, so he decided uh, to do it anyway, though, because the king said, if you don't name it Pennsylvania, I'm not going to give you the, the uh, charter. So he decided to do it, took all of his Quaker followers with him, and he settled in Pennsylvania, and he created what he called a holy experiment, a relit, uh, uh, area that was open to everyone with the exception of Catholics and Jews. Catholics and Jews were forbidden from um, settling in, um, in, the, in the area, so in Pennsylvania. It was well put together, well organized. It was very peaceful. The capital is called Philadelphia, and it's, it's, it means the city of brotherly love. It was the best advertised of all the colonies, and they got along really well with the local Native Americans, and sometimes the Native Americans lived in and amongst the Quakers and got along well with them. Here's the king giving the charter to Penn. Uh, the Quakers were, were taught to quake at the word of God. They feared God. It says here they abhorred strife and warfare and refused military service. So very, very peaceful people. And in fact, the, the uh, Quakers were the first in the colonies to oppose the practice of slavery. Before them, no one else had come out and said slavery is wrong. The Quakers said slavery should be banned. So they're the first to come out against it, against slavery. And they were heavily persecuted in England, much like any other religion that wasn't Anglican in England. And there's William Penn. You could see some Native Americans here in this painting um, that are around him. And there's where Pennsylvania is. Across the river from Pennsylvania is New Jersey, which is another one of the middle colonies. It was started in 1664 when two noble pr proprietors uh, received the area from the Duke of York. A proprietor is someone who uh, gets a piece of, get, has uh permission from the king to go settle in an area and basically a proprietor is an extension of the king he becomes the king in the colony like in new jersey many quakers traveled across the river into new jersey and were welcomed into new jersey as well delaware is another uh, middle colony settled by the swedish uh, named after lord delaware the harsh military governor who had arrived in virginia in 1610 he said he moved up to Delaware. Delaware is going to be is a very fertile area. They have harbors there, um, and uh, and they also allowed slavery, as we'll be talking about later on. Um, so let's let's uh, put everything together with this last slide right here on the middle colonies. We've looked at the southern colonies. Remember the southern colonies: Virginia, Maryland, North Carolina, South uh, South Carolina, and Georgia. The, those are the southern colonies. The northern colonies that we just studied, Massachusetts, Rhode Island, Connecticut, New Hampshire, the middle colonies, New York, Pennsylvania, Delaware, and New Jersey. So there's your 13 colonies. Make sure you know them and know them well. Um, the the uh, middle colonies are marked by fertile soil. The, fer the middle colonies become the breadbasket of the colonies because this is where the corn, this is where the wheat, this is where the barley this is where the potatoes are grown, food, and they supply the rest of the 13 colonies at times with food, breadbasket of the colonies. In the north, they grew crops, but they're subsistence farms. In the south, they grew mainly um, tobacco, and you can't eat tobacco, uh, but they did grow some rice and some sugar, but not as much as tobacco. Uh, the middle colonies were marked by religious toleration because they were so racially diverse. If you're coming to America and you want to try to climb the ladder of success and go from being penniless to being rich by owning land, you're going to move to the middle colonies. You're not going to go to the north because it's hard to get rich in the north. There's, there's no farms. You're not going to go to the south because 
you're going to be uh, competing with slave labor. You're, you're not going to be able to get a job. So you're going to try to go to the middle colonies where there's lots of farms, not they, they're, you can grow food and there, there's no slaves there in the middle colonies other than in Delaware. Um, so you, you can get a job and maybe make some money. And then you hope that someday you'd be able to buy a piece of land and start growing crops and making some money that way. So many people from many different countries settled in the middle colonies, the Dutch, the Swedes, the English, the Spanish, the Irish, and the Scots Irish all settled in this area. So there's a lot of religious toleration. It's marked by great farming techniques because, you know, these countries, they do their own thing in their own country and they bring over their farm techniques to America and they really were dialed in when it came to farming. Very fertile soil, lots of food. So those are the middle colonies. And that is the end of chapter three.